Good morning. morning. Welcome to everyone this morning. Welcome to those who are joining us online. Good Friday. We are here to commemorate the crucifixion of Jesus and the death of Calvary. Romans 5, 8, it states, God demonstrates his own love for us. And this, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Amen. Jesus, he himself is the Lamb of God. As John saw him coming, behold, the Lamb of God who can take the world, who can take the sins of the world. So in that, he himself is a good shepherd. That he was able to lay his life for us. As we come and ponder and reflect on the death of Jesus, it is through him, his sacrifice, we can be redeemed. We can be saved. Today, we will have a special service. We will reflect on the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. We will have different, various speakers. And I'll just pray that we will all be transformed as we hear once again those sayings of Jesus that it speaks to us today. So I'm going to ask you to stand We're going to come into the throne of grace. We're going to pray, and then we're going to ask the worship team to join us here at the altar. So let us join in prayer. We thank you, God, this morning for your presence among us. From the very beginning, you had a redemptive plan to rescue and redeem us through your son, Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice of laying down his life for us. Taking God's wrath upon him so we can be reconciled with the Father. We rejoice in what you have accomplished. We are so utterly thankful that grace drawed us into you. Father, we pray that our eyes would be open, our ears will be attentive, our hearts, Father, will receive the message that each of our various speakers have as they speak and say and declare the words that had and were spoken from the cross. I pray that you will anoint them through your spirit. And Father, as we hear the testimonies, may we come to conviction, to healing, the comfort that you offer through your words. Have your way among us, Lord. Extend your grace to all who are in need. And bring those who are still in darkness to light and truth. We thank you, Jesus, for your love, your faithfulness. We know it wasn't those nails that held you, but it was the love of the Father, and it was the love of us, all of us. We 
Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
no other final words are more notable or important. Why did Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, say what he said before he hung his head? What exactly did he say before he died? On the third, I heard the word, he did indeed rise. Seven things he said as he was being crucified. These things were said to individuals and to the crowd that day. But what does it all mean? And what does he say to us today? Through his word and wisdom, how does it affect our Christendom? Firstly, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Already being in so much pain, falsely accused, beaten, whipped, his beard plucked, tortured and mocked, but not yet completely slain. His concern for others, some may think was insane. He spoke to a repentant sinner hanging beside him and said, Assuredly, today you will be with me in paradise. While nailed to the cross, that death-dealing device, a third statement he'd utter to Mary, his mother. Woman, behold your son. To John, behold your mother. During his dying at day, it was so dark with no sun to see. He cried out in a loud voice, My God! My God! Why have you forsaken me? He had nothing to drink, so naturally he told anyone listening that I am thirsty. From a sponge on a hyssop reed, a soldier gave him some sour wine. His thirst was never diminished. Others said, leave him, let him save himself. He didn't. But before he died, he said, it's, it's finished. The sky was black, the temple veil ripped from top to bottom, and in a loud voice for all present to hear, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. bowed his head and died for us a death of the very worst kind an innocent man crucified listen can you hear his cries listen do you realize he died for us Listen to the seven last words of Jesus. Good morning, friends. I was asked to do a short testimony today on one of the sayings of Jesus' seven sayings. I chose Luke 23, 34. Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they are doing. 
let's put ourselves in a time where someone has really hurt us to the point of even disowning us. Maybe a close friend or a relative. These people may have been people that you dearly loved. And you would do anything to protect them from harm. Maybe even to the point of laying down your own life for them. My testimony today takes me back to when my parents passed away. My father passed first and several years later, I lost my mother to cancer. My parents were married close to 67 years. Right after my mother's funeral, my brother and sister turned against me and disowned me as their brother. The neighbors said to me that the family was in the front yard of her house, fighting over her belongings, arguing over what each one of them should take and what they deserve. It's been close to 10 years now since my mother's passing and there's still a division in our family. Two years ago, I sent both of them a Christmas card asking them that we could get together and put whatever it was in the past behind us. I ended my card with the words, I love you. The only response I received back was from my sister, still very angry, ending her letter in You're Not My Brother. Now to my son, my only son. I agreed, him and I agreed that he could live in the rental house beside my mother's place. Our agreement was that he could keep the grass cut, keep the yards up, of the two properties and he would only have to pay 500 a month in rent just in order to keep the bills and stuff up. When my mother passed, he too thought he was entitled to grandmother's house. That would have been a great idea if he had have paid his rent. You see, he didn't pay his rent because he thought he was my son, that he deserved it. He was entitled. I never knew what that word meant until this time. One day I had to go and cut the grass and clean up the yards. My son and his wife stopped me from seeing my only granddaughter. While I was doing that, at a distance, my granddaughter gave me a wave and smiled. To that point, my son got so angry he came out to take a swing at me and pushed me over just for waving at her. They even called the police to have me, or try to have me removed from cutting my own grass. A short time later, I had to evict him. Things were so bad, I had to evict him before they destroyed the property altogether. It's been close to 10 years since I've seen them. And in fact, I sent them the Christmas letter as well, just a card to my son. And I found out that his wife kept that card from him for th several months. He didn't even know I was trying to reach out to him. Through all of this, I turned in prayer, asking the Lord, how do I deal with this? The loss of so many family members, the loss of my son. One day I was driving through London and I prayed to the Lord for guidance. Lord, give me help on how to deal with this. At that very moment, the very moment still driving, he answered my prayers. My son, too, I have lost family members. Day after day, some of my children turn away from me, making up lies, and yes, even crucifying my son. John 15, 18 says, If the world hates you, 
keep in mind and remember, the world hated me first. He said to me, keep your thoughts on me, keep focused, and I will always be with you. I received comfort from his words, and I feel stronger on how to deal with things and the loss of my family. Still today, I receive that, and I encourage us all to remember how Jesus taught us. With grace, with love, and how to deal with even hatred. Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they are doing. God bless you. Buenos días a todos. Good morning. Que el Señor les bendiga. God bless you all. Traigo la segunda palabra. I bring before you the second saying of Jesus. Cuando Él estaba en la cruz. When He was in the cross. En verdad te digo. Truly I tell you. Que hoy estarás <coughs> conmigo. Today you will be with me. En el paraíso. In paradise. Este es el justo momento en que Jesús. This is the moment when Jesus. Nuestro Señor. Our Lord. Aún estando. A través de su condición de sufrimiento. Even though through the condition of his suffering. Muestra una vez más al mundo. La, sorry, la benignidad de Dios a través de del plan de salvación. Once again shows the world the kindness of God through the plan of salvation. Tres cruces. Three crosses. Dos representando a la humanidad. Two representing humanity. La rebelión. Rebellion. Y el arrepentimiento. And repentance. Y la otra. And the other one. La redención. Redemption. Esta frase es una promesa que Jesús This phrase is a promise that Jesus makes. le hace únicamente al ladrón en la cruz. Who makes it exclusively to the thief hanging on the cross on the right. Este hombre quien al principio injuriaba contra él, This man who initially insulted against him, y que al enfrentarse a la muerte, and when facing death, reconociendo su propia condición de pecado, recognizes his own sinful condition, experimentó un cambio en su corazón, experienced a change of heart lo cual es llamado which is called conversión conversion reconociendo a Jesús como su Dios se arrepintió de corazón acknowledging Jesus as God repented sincerely y finalmente pudo gozar de la salvación prometida and finally was able to enjoy the promised salvation Mientras tanto, el otro ladrón, Meanwhile, the other thief, colgado a la izquierda hanging to the left of Jesus, de Jesús, quien también injuriaba contra él, who also insulted against him, y que se supone nunca cambió su actitud, and supposedly never changed his attitude, ni se arrepintió de sus pecados, nor he repented of his sins, representa a la humanidad represents the humanity que se niega a reconocer y aceptar a Jesús como su único y suficiente Salvador. 
It represents the, what refu who, the, the humanity that refuses to recognize and accept Jesus as the only and sufficient Savior. Decidiendo continuar enemistado con Dios y perecer en sus delitos y pecados. Deciding to remain estranged from God and perish in his transgressions and sins. De igual manera, Jesús quiere mostrar al mundo que no importa la naturaleza del pecado cometido. Jesus wants to show the world that no matter the nature of the sin committed, Él es el único que tiene la potestad de perdonar nuestros pecados. He is the only one who has the authority to forgive our sins y heredar la vida eterna. and inherit eternal life. Es una gran bendición para mí este día poder compartir con ustedes este testimonio. It is a great blessing for me to be able to share my testimony. Recuerdo como mi madre, quien durante toda su vida se aferró a la tradición familiar. I remember how my mother, who clung to family tradition through her life, reaccionó negativamente cuando decidí seguir a Jesús a través de mi conversión. Reacted neg negatively when I decided to follow Jesus through my conversion. En aquel momento, fue la primera persona en criticar mi conversión. At that moment, it was my mother who was the first person to criticize my conversion. Asegurándome que me estaban engañando y que cambiar de religión era un error. Assuring me that I was being deceived and that changing religion was a mistake. Pronto, mis hermanos se unieron a ella para reprocharme la misma situación. Soon my siblings joined with her in reproaching me. For Sin the same situation. Sin embargo, aferrado a la mano de Jesús y a sus promesas. However, clinging to Jesus' hand and his promises. Con mucha oración y testimonio. With much prayer and testimony. Pude presenciar la gloria de Dios. I was able to feel the glory of God. Fue el momento de profunda alegría cuando tiempo después. It was a moment of deep joy when later my Mi hermano mayor me comunicó que había aceptado a Cristo. When my older brother told me that he himself had Como accepted Christ as his savior. Pero la mayor alegría llegó cuando en los últimos días de vida de mi madre. But the greatest joy came when in the last days of my mother's life. Y antes de yo partir hacia este país. And before I left to come to this country. En su debilidad debida a su enfermedad. In her weakness due to her illness. Me hizo una sorprendente pregunta que hizo latir fuertemente mi corazón de felicidad. She asked me a surprising question that made my heart beat strongly with happiness. ¿Por qué Jesús le dijo al ladrón, en verdad te digo que hoy estarás conmigo en el paraíso? What did Jesus say to the thief, truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise? Esta promesa que Jesús le hizo al ladrón en la cruz. This promise that Jesus made to the thief on the cross. Me brindó la oportunidad de hablarle a mi madre sobre el plan de salvación de Dios. Gave me the opportunity to speak to my mother about God's plan of salvation. Uh, después de orar con ella y finalmente aceptar a Cristo como su salvador. And after I prayed with her, she accepted finally Christ as her savior. Días después partió de este mundo. Days later she departed from this world. Hoy vivo con la esperanza de volver a verla en el cielo. Today I live with the hope of seeing her again in heaven. Cuando estemos ante la presencia de nuestro Dios. When we all will be in the presence of God. Dios le bendiga. Amen. God bless you. as they have a special.
the preacher talking about three wooden crosses upon a hill for everyone to see. Two sinners on the outside couldn't save themselves if they tried. All I could think is, man, that sounds like me. I've been the one on the left full of guilt and regret, long gone on the wrong side of living. I've been the one on the right, always looking for a fight, thinking I could never be forgiven. I'm standing here today overwhelmed by grace, cause I know who paid my cost. Thank God for the man on the middle cross. didn't have to do it but for me he went through it a love like that i'll never understand lord knows i don't deserve it and i know i couldn't earn it mercy rained down on this desperate man i've been the one on the left full of guilt and on the wrong side of living I've been the one on the right Always looking for a fight Thinking I can never be forgiven I'm standing here today Overwhelmed by grace Cause I know who paid my cost Thank God For the man on the middle cross The cross is where he went But that ain't where he stayed brought me back to life when he rose up out of that grave. Someday I'll stand before him and I'll see Jesus face to face. I'll worship and adore him for a life forever changed. I've been the one on the left full of guilt and regret, long gone on the wrong side of living. I've been the one on the right, always looking for a fight, thinking I could never be forgiven. I'm standing here today overwhelmed by grace, cause I know who pay my cost. Thank God for the man. The third saying of Jesus on the cross, taken from John 19, 26 and 27. I am reading from the NIV. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Jesus used the term woman when he spoke to his mother. In the Greek language, this was a highly respectful and affectionate mode of address. The word loses its nuance when translated into English. Jesus was inviting his mother to look to John to be her son now. Despite his physical agony, Jesus was concerned about the welfare of his mother and the pain she was experiencing. With his thoughts on Mary's future security and protection, Jesus entrusted her into the care of John, his beloved disciple. Typically, a dying son would commit his mother into the care of another member of his immediate family. But Jesus knew that none of his half-brothers were disciples yet. They had not accepted his claims or committed to his mission. 
John was the only apostle brave enough to take a stand with the women who had accompanied Jesus to the cross. The rest had scattered, abandoning the Lord in fear. John had proven himself to be trustworthy and faithful to Jesus. How does this third saying of Jesus on the cross resonate with me and my testimony as a follower of Jesus? I accepted Jesus into my heart as a child of nine or ten. My parents sent us to be kids to Sunday school from an early age. It was a small evangelical church and soundly grounded in the word. At three and four, I began to learn that Jesus loved me. Amid the incomprehensible pain of crucifixion and the agony of being separated from the Father, Jesus' tender love, compassion, protection, and provision for his mother speak so loudly of his love. Of course, I couldn't comprehend the depth of his love as a child, but over time, much time, I have experienced his love time and time again. His provision, his compassion, and his protection. I learned as a child that I could pray to Jesus, and he would help me when I was nervous about my piano recital worried about my tests at school, dealing with stresses of being a teen, in the cares of a young adult, a wife, a mother, and a grandmother. My interests are always his heart. Jesus has been faithful all these years, and I can attest to the fact that when we taste and see that the Lord is good, we will not be disappointed. Does that mean that my life has been clear sailing? No. That I have always been obedient to his ways? No. There have been bumps, lots of bumps in the road. There have been deep valleys, but also mountaintops. Have I ever questioned what God was doing in my life? Yes. We may not understand why in our, the why in our lives, but I can assure you that God's ways are perfect. He has given me answers to some of my queries, not right away, but down the road some, and some are still pending. If I have been disobedient to his ways, but repent, he will get me out of trouble. However, there are always consequences. I have learned from these mistakes. Yes, his ways are higher than our ways, but I can trust that he absolutely takes me on the best route, all in line with his plan for my life to give me hope and a future. On this Good Friday, I am moved as I ponder the cross and realize what Jesus did for me. Yes, Jesus loves me, and he loves you too. He set us free, free from ourselves. He did this for all of us. We need only to submit to his riches. Chapter 15, verse 34, it says, 
Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever felt forsaken by God? It's hard to believe that Jesus, the Son of God, on the cross, felt forsaken by his Father. But in that moment, he did, because that's what he cried out. I remember a time in my young life, I was a young lady of 18 years old, fresh out of high school, and I wanted to go to Bible college. And so I did. I went to um, Ontario Bible College in Toronto, which is now known as Tyndale University. And I lived in dorm, and I went to school full time. I struggled. I struggled. Because my young teenage life was so full of shame and sin, despite the fact that I had been raised in a wonderful little Baptist church in the small town of Petrolia. I knew how to do the right things and look the part, but something was deeply missing in my life. And I struggled with so much shame that it was very difficult for me to study. It was very difficult for me to learn. It was very difficult for me to make friends. I felt so isolated, so alone, and so homesick. Being in the big city of Toronto, coming from a very small urban town. But that wasn't the reason why I felt all of this. I knew that I had sin in my life. And I remember being so overwhelmed with it on more than one occasion through that year that I would go to the ladies' washroom and there was one little room that had a bathtub in it where I could lock the door. And I would get down on my knees with the Bible in my hand and I would sob and cry. I didn't even know what verses to look up in the Bible. I was so lost. I just was so lonely and I knew that there was something that was keeping me from having a very full and free relationship with God but I didn't know how to get it and here I was in a Bible college of all places where there were so many wonderful teachers and so many wonderful professors and so many wonderful Christian people all around me but the voice outside my ear kept saying, you can't tell anybody. You can't go to anybody and get, ask them for help. You can't tell them what it is you're so ashamed of because if you do, they are going to cast you out. They're not going to understand. They're going to think you're crazy. I was dealing with a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression and a lot of fear. But by the grace of God, somehow or other, I studied and studied and studied and got through that one year. It was a one-year special course I took with the option if I wanted to continue, I could. I couldn't get my suitcases packed fast enough to get home where I felt safe and loved and accepted by my family and, and by my what was familiar to me. I never did get an answer that year. I struggled through it. It wasn't until oh, four years or so later that God did answer my prayers because he is such a wonderful God. I was married to that wonderful man sitting there. We had our first little girl. She was close to a year old. And I, we were living in Sarnia at an, in an apartment complex. And I really wanted to go to church. And I wanted my little girl to have the same good influences in her life that I had, that my parents blessed me with. 
And I was still hungry for wanting to work out my relationship with Jesus. And I didn't know how to do it, but there was this church that I could walk to. And so I did. And I was about 21, 20, I was 22. So if you can imagine, I was such a young child. No wonder our parents were worried about us, Walt. I know they were. <laughs> uh, at the end of the service, I would have Melanie in my arms. She, she could barely walk. And the senior pastor would always be standing at the door, you know, to greet everyone as they leave. And Pastor Lloyd Fretz would take my hand, and he would as actually address me as Mrs. Provence, which I always found funny because he was my father's age, and I was this kid, and he's addressing me that way. But he did, and he wouldn't let go of my hand. And he'd look me in the eye with such kindness, and he'd say, Mrs. Provence, it's so good to see you here this morning. I just want you to know, if you ever need anybody to talk to, just call the office and make an appointment. I would love to meet with you if, if you're willing. He must have said that to me maybe three or four Sundays over a few months. And every time he said that to me, it just, because it was God. It, it was an experience I'd never had before. It was like God was saying, my daughter, come and talk to me, come to me. So I took him up on the offer finally and I called and made an appointment. And I went into that office and we talked. And he it was safe and he didn't misunderstand and he didn't pass judgment on me. And I was able to be honest with him and he looked at me and he said, Louise, you need deliverance. And when it said that word deliverance, it was like something just jumped off my back. And that was my answer. I didn't know what that was, but I knew that God had heard me all along those few years ago, and he was bringing me to the answer. And it took a few months of me regularly making appointments with Pastor Lloyd and his wife taking me under her wing too and meeting with them on a regular basis and working through so many things in my relationship with Jesus and with God. And I was finally set free of so many things, so much bondage. And for the first time in my life, I knew what it was like to have Jesus in my heart and to have the Holy Spirit and to have that full, free relationship with God like never before. I cannot thank the Lord enough for that. As I pondered this verse and thinking about our Savior Jesus who was God in man form, on the cross and saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was experiencing the bondage of all of mankind. For me, for you, for everyone, the pain, all that sin, all that shame. And for a moment, because God cannot look upon sin, his father did have to turn his back away from our sin that Jesus was paying the price for and taken on his back on that cross. He did that because of a love that is just, we, I believe we have a, sometimes a minute understanding of what that love is that Jesus did for us on that cross. And I am just so grateful that Jesus did that for me. Because if he hadn't, I wouldn't be standing here today even sharing how real he is and how he answers our prayers.
Amen. Please stand up. Stop to worship the Lord Jesus, the old rugged cross. On a hill far away, through the old Roger cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that our cross, and it is the best for a world. to the church. 
As I contemplated the fifth thing from the cross of Jesus, I thirst. There are a few things that the Spirit dropped in that God shared with me to share with you. Have you ever stood in the sun on a hot, sunny day? Maybe, perhaps, not eaten. And you're standing in the sun for a really long time. And it brings you to the point of almost feeling faint. I have. And it brings an overwhelming feeling of thirst. But that feeling of thirst is minuscule. It cannot compare to the thirst that Jesus felt as he hung on a cross at Calvary. And he was there for you and I. He was there by choice. The scripture tells us that Jesus said he was thirsty. And he was expressing a physical need. The scripture also tells us in Matthew chapter 27, 34, and Mark 15, 23, that there were two previous occasions when Jesus was offered something to drink. And it tells us that on both of these occasions that Jesus refused. Now, if you're thirsty or you've had a day much like what I described earlier, you would be prone and you would want to drink that water. But Jesus did not take that water because he wanted us to experience the fullness of what was going to happen at Calvary. He wanted to be totally aware of what was happening. And many times in our lives, we go through hardships. We go through difficult times. And we want those times to go quickly. We want to get out of them. But God is saying to us today that he is the refiner. And he is saying to us, don't rush the trials. The trials are for a purpose. Jesus is our example. And he did not rush the experience of the cross. He did not drink the water that he was offered earlier. And it teaches us that despite the pain, the process results in victory. That's what Jesus teaches us by refusing the initial drink of water. And when he finally decided to take something to drink, the soldiers gave him a branch of, with, on a cloth of hyssop. And hyssop, the first mention of hyssop in the Bible was in Exodus 12, verse 22 to 23. And this is the account of the Passover. And in this account, and in Jesus having something to drink on a branch of hyssop, it reminds us that Jesus is the cleanser and that he is our deliverer. Because from the Old Testament, that is the example that we see that hyssop was used to represent. So indeed, Jesus is our cleanser and he is the, our deliverer. Jesus said, I thirst. Jesus is asking, are you thirsty? Psalm 42 and verse 2 tells us, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Who can I go to and meet with God? God, Jesus, he is able to fully satisfy our thirst. Because he is our deliverer. He is our refiner. He is the only one that can quench our thirst. And Jesus responds in John 4, 13. Everyone who drinks the water will never thirst again. Today, Jesus is inviting us to taste and see that he is good. He is the only one that can satisfy Come, drink, and never thirst again. Thank you.
Good morning. I will be speaking on It Is Finished from John 19 and verse 30. Jesus tasted of the vinegar and the gall, and he said, it is finished. Jesus became the final and ultimate sacrifice for sin, according to God's will that was prophesied. He faced crucifixion with humility and self-control, knowing that he has now fully accomplished God's will and paid for our sins in full. All this written shall be fulfilled. It is written. Jesus tenderly provided for his mother before he died. Jesus' example teaches all men to honor their mother in life and in death, to promote their mother's comfort by every means in their power. When Jesus says it is finished, he meant it was paid in full that his suffering was now finished both of his soul and that of his body. It is finished. The work of man's salvation and redemption is now completed. His life was not taken from him by force, but fully given up. Jesus paid the ultimate price for the sins of the world on behalf of humanity. Now that it is finished, it is done, there is nothing left on his part, but it, is le it left us to take the sacrifice he made for us and gratefully accept it on his behalf. Jesus paid a debt for us that we could not have paid. His sacrifice was enough. The songwriter says, I am standing here today all because you made a way. He made a way. He made a way. I am standing here today all because he made a way. I am standing right here today because Jesus made a way for me. I came here in 1988 and I was not saved. But I, made, I, I found a wonderful Filipino lady by the name of Mommy. And she loved me. And I learned from her. She was so precious to me. She's now in heaven. And I miss her, I can tell you. She taught me how to pray. She taught me how to love. And I received Christ as my savior. And I can tell you today, I would not turn anything for what I have received from Christ. He's my all in all. He's my provider. He's my savior. He's my comforter. He tells me, he shows me, he directs me. I love him. And so today, if you are here, and it's your first time here, and you do not know Christ, as your Lord and Savior. There are people here that will pray for you so that you come to know this wonderful 
savior that I have come to know. He has done so much for me. We are off. I am glad. So I say to you today, continue to love your God because there is nothing left in this world for us. Let us keep our eyes on him. Let us focus on him because he has everything that we need and he will give only if you ask. May God bless you. The seventh saying of Jesus on the cross and his last words as a human being were from Luke uh, 23, verse uh, 46. I, I'm reading from the message version of the Bible. Jesus called loudly, loudly, Father, I place my life in your hands. Then he breathed his last. By this time, it was dark in Mount Calvary, and the temple curtain was split down in the middle as a symbol of our free pass into the very presence of God. Jesus' life can be summarized in his last words. An earthly life of submission to the Father his submission was not, not, was not imposed. He chose to surrender his will completely for us. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 8 says and describes the most powerful act of surrender. The incarnation which starts with the almighty eternal God encapsulated in a tiny baby body. The incarnation ends with words of death over him. The body will be destroyed, lifeless, but his spirit was in his father's care. As we remember the last words of Jesus on the cross, I ask you, you people, how willing are we to fully surrender our lives to God the body of Jesus was destroyed. The only thing that remained was his human spirit. And even that Jesus surrendered in the midst of our worries and anxieties. In a world that is continually agitated but by war and evil, are we willing to surrender our beings to Jesus? His last words in the on the cross should be ours. Father, I, Javier, John, Mary, Rose, Pablo, Paul, Juan, I place my life in your hands. I trust my whole being into your care, even in death. I am safe because I am under your wings. May that be our prayer today. There is a song, an old hymn. And the title is, I Surrender All. I will sing it the, the first time in Spanish. Yo me rindo él. And then the second time, please join me in singing this song. Yo me rindo a él. Yo me rindo a él. Todo a Cristo yo entrego. Yo me rindo a él. I surrender all.
bless you all. Thank you to all those who participated in the seven saints of the cross. I want to highlight what Javier said in his last words of Jesus. It says that when Jesus cried out, in a loud voice, the last saying is, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rock split, and many tombs broke open. From that moment, according to Hebrews 10, 19 to 22, it speaks and says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and says we have a great priest over the house of God. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. We have the freedom to enter into his presence because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We can partake of the new covenant because he has given us a new way of living and we are to live a life that is honoring and godly to Jesus Christ. Because of the shedding of Jesus' blood, the payment of our Sins has been paid in full, and glory be to God. Jesus is our high priest, offering all for once the sacrifice for us all. Before we partake into entering and administering into the elements of communion, if there is anyone who has not yet come to know the love of Christ, for those hearts who continue to be walking in guilt and shame, lost, today you have the opportunity to be drawn to Jesus. Nothing we could have done to pay our sins. But it was the precious Lamb of God who was able and who's able to wash you and cleanse you because he paid the ransom for you. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. And if, if anyone needs that Savior Jesus, the altar is open. You can come and approach him. 
and confess that you are a sinner, that you need him so. For those who have walked at a distance, knowing that Jesus is someone that you've known. But life at times pulls us in different ways. And we grow distance from him. Today is the day that you can be reconciled to the Father because of Jesus. The altar is open for you as well. For those who are in need of prayer. For healing. For grief. For pain. Anything that you may be battling inside of you our intercessors will join you in prayer but don't miss the opportunity on a good Friday and it is a good Friday because of what Jesus did and you would receive a touch of God upon your life As he was lifted, all men will be drawn to him. He's able, he's faithful. Oh, Jesus, we need you. We need you every hour. Oh, we need you. Every minute. We need you. Jesus, show us your way. You said you are the truth, the life. You are the way when we have been so lost. Jesus, thank you for your precious sacrifice. We were lost, but we have been found. to Jesus, all to Jesus, all to Jesus, thank you Jesus, hallelujah, all to Jesus, we surrender thee, we surrender thee, we surrender thee, all to Jesus. Can we sing that? Amen. 
able to take it all. His wounds we have been healed and because of Jesus because the Son of God we are free indeed the Spirit of God is here to set us free. Jesus came to set the captives free. Jesus came for those who were blind to give sight. Father, today is a day to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news of salvation because of what Jesus did in the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Drawing men children, youth, everyone, be drawn to the one who's able to save your life, and that is Jesus Christ. Come and see and taste that the Lord is good. He is good. This is Good Friday. This is a good Friday. One life saved. One life reconciled to Christ. People being delivered, healed, touched. Oh, it's a good Friday because of Jesus. Because of what he did. And he willingly gave his life. Because. Jesus, he got to enjoy the last supper with his disciples. We are disciples of Christ. We all have been invited to partake the bread and wine emblems of his broken body and shed blood for us. This is the table. This is the feast. It's for all of us. Let all those who have found true repentance forsaken their sins and have believed in Christ unto salvation no, no drill near to partake these emblems by faith we partake in the life of Jesus Christ to your to my comfort and joy let us remember the passion of our Lord Jesus it's a good Friday oh but we are so looking forward to feast 
on their wrists in Christ. He died. He's risen. Oh, he will come again. Praise God. Father, us. We experience your mercies that are new each morning upon our lives. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, for the redemption that he offered unto us. We partake today of the benefits of his atoning sacrifice. I'm going to ask Pastor Pod to come, Damien. Savior, come, take upon these elements and remember Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for you and I.
took the bread, broke it, and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Damien, would you lead us? Father God, as we have gathered your people to remember the cross and to remember God the battering, the bruising, the beating that you received on our behalf. Father, we humbly bow in acknowledgement and we say thank you. As we partake, God, of this emblem, we do remember your death until you come. Eat according to the word of God. Likewise, this after supper, he took the cup and when he had given things, he gave it to them saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this when you drink it in the remembrance of me. Pastor Una. Let us drink together. Father, we thank you for your instruction to continue participating of your shed blood, your broken body, symbolizing that indeed you paid the price in full. And you told your followers to repeat it, continue doing it until the day when you return. Help us to be ready, to be prepared. We thank you, Lord, for this great provision that you have made. And we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. We will continue to celebrate and commemorate the death of Jesus Christ until he comes again and Amen. he will gloriously come back. Praise God. Amen. Be seated. Thank uh, you. Please be seated and, and I want to read the benediction. So extend your hands, please, and listen to the word of God for us today. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Amen? Amen. God bless you.